Good morning, everyone. My name is Colin Charles, and I'm an instructor with the Educational Services Department here in Redlands, California. Um, you've already listened to Wayne, and Wayne will be helping me with questions and answers. He's from the editing team in the development group here at ESRI. So we want to welcome you all to today's live training seminar entitled Editing in ArcGIS Tips and Tricks 2. Now, today's seminar will cover three main topics, sketching in ArcMap, constraint challenges, and subdivision of lines. The format of the presentation is to talk a little about the topic, show you a software demonstration to illustrate some of the concepts that we've just discussed, and then to do a quick review and then answer some questions from you. And uh, so start sending those questions if you can. So our first topic is called sketching in ArcMap. And this is a real quick review of uh, some of the common sketch sketching challenges that you may have. So one of the first sketch challenges is how do I go about creating a natural resource polygon such as a lake? Um, natural resource polygons generally consist of straight line segments where the vertices are placed visually rather than placed at a specific coordinate position with a specific angle, direction, or length. So how do I go about creating such a natural resource feature? I would use the sketch tool. So start, start editing, specify my target layer, pick up the sketch tool, more specifically the sketch tool that has the pencil icon to it. I start sketching my vertices. Between each vertice, segments are generated for me. The segments are connected to create the sketch, which in turn is committed to create the feature. Now you probably know all this already. Now that's a little bit of sketching 101. So you generate vertices, segments made in between them. These become the sketch, and the sketch is committed to become the feature once you save. Now, this is a little different when you're capturing things like a building footprint or a man-made resource, where the polygon that you capture for, in this example, the building footprint, may need some of its segments to have a specified length, or may need to be parallel to a, another boundary, or at a particular angle, or may have a curve of some sort as well. So how do I go about constraining some of these segments that I may be generating? So just to note, in a man-made feature, the feature itself may have some straight and curved segments where the segments might be constrained. Well, to do this, I would again use the sketch tool, but this time apply some of the constraints that the sketch tool will allow me to do. These constraints are things like place the next vertex visually or by a specific coordinate somewhere, or place the next vertex or segment relative to another feature parallel or perpendicular or even deflected from the angle of the last vertex placed, or specify that the next segment be generated at a distance away from the last vertex or a direction or even both of those. And of course, to get to these constraints or these different options, you right mouse click while sketching and the context menu will give you access to all of these. To place a curved segment, you could use a tangent curve constraint or you may switch your sketch tool to one of the sketch tools that will allow you to create curves as well. So here's what the, the sketch tool constraints look like. Well, this is the menu, the, con the um, context menu, that gives you access to those constraints. And notice that in the constraints or in the um, context menu, you have options to limit, restrict, or even prescribe how your sketch segments should be constructed. You can add sketch segments parallel or perpendicular, as I mentioned. You may also add them at or add a vertex at a specific absolute x, y, or a delta or f offset in x and y from a previous vertex that you generated. Or you may specify that the next segment be generated by direction or at a deflection angle from the last vertex or at a specific length or directional length or even have a tangent curve. Uh, the idea with this is just to illustrate how some of these different constraints or options will allow you to further define how the feature you're creating will be generated. Now, most of these different constraints have shortcut keys. And the shortcut keys are very helpful in that while you're sketching, you use a shortcut key rather than a right mouse click to get to them. So some common shortcuts that you may use from time to time would be, say, Control-L to type in a specified length for the next segment. Or perhaps you'd like to uh, specify both the direction and length so you may use the control G option to do so. Or if you want to apply a parallel constraint, control P would do that for you. Um, the T key is very useful. So while you're busy sketching, if you want to visualize and see what your tolerance for snapping currently is, press the T key and it'll show you your current snap tolerance. If you wanted to see the vertexes of a feature, 
while you're working with the sketch tool, hold your V key down and it'll show you the vertexes that are there. Of course, you may recall from the uh, earlier tips and tricks presentations that we've done before, uh, you also have the option of using the X key while you're working to zoom out, the Z key to zoom in, and the C key to pan around while you're busy sketching. So you don't really have to switch to the tool's toolbar if you use the Z, X, and C keys while working. The last shortcut key you want to note is the E key. So while sketching, you may want to switch from the sketch tool back to the edit tool or perhaps back to the edit annotation tool. And by using the E key, you can suspend your current sketch tool. And this will allow you to go back to the edit tool or the annotation edit tool if you wish to. One more area that's important for you to take note of if you are going to use some of these sketch constraints while creating new features is to look at help. Now, the help is very comprehensive in ArcGIS, but sometimes it's a little difficult to find exactly what you need. And more specifically, help about a particular constraint would be easier if it were available in context when you are working with that particular constraint. Now, this can be done by using the What's This tool. And you'd recognize the What's This tool, which is available on your standard toolbar in ArcMap, by an arrow and a question mark. So it's a button with an arrow question mark. Now, by taking the What's This tool and pointing at and clicking on something, it should return for you very specific, detailed, context-sensitive help about that particular topic. Now, you can also access this by using the Shift F1. So while you're in the, the context menu as you're sketching, and you may want to use perhaps a absolute XY constraint, by Shift F1 or clicking Shift F1, you can get specific context help about that particular constraint that you're pointing at within the construction menu or the um, context menu that you may be working with. So let's stop for a minute and show you your very first demonstration. And in this demonstration, I'm going to briefly show you how to use the sketch tools to create a natural resource feature such as this lake polygon, and also how to use the sketch tools to create a man-made feature such as a building footprint. So my target layer at this point, once I start editing, should be the lake layer. And it is, in fact, set as such. Now, I'm not really going to set any snapping tolerances or any snap agents at this point because I'm working on a feature that consists of several straight line segments. So the process is really simple. Pick the, the sketch tool and start the process of sketching. Now, before I do, I'm going to undo it because I'd like to show you the use of the context-sensitive help first. Now remember the What's This tool. So by taking the What's This tool from the Tools toolbar and pointing at a specific thing, such as the Create New Menu task, notice how it gives me context help about that particular menu as I clicked. Alternatively, I could have used the Shift F1 option, and let's do that. So I'm going to hold Shift F1. Notice how the icon or the cursor has changed, and this time I'm going to get some help on the target layer. Again, context-specific help about something that I would like to work on. Now, you may ask, well, why is he not showing me the context help for the sketch tool? Well, this is because the sketch tool help is fairly comprehensive and really big, and it'll probably split, split up and be beyond the screen capacity that you're viewing right now. So I'm showing you just some simple help, but when you get down to doing it yourself, please do feel free to practice and try it out. All right, so back again to sketching. So we're in the Create New Feature task. We've got our lake feature, and we're just really going to quickly sketch the boundary. Now notice I'm creating vertexes, and between the vertexes, the software is creating segments for me. Once I've generated everything I need to, in other words, all the individual vertexes that define the boundary of this feature for me, a double click would end, or a right mouse click and finish sketch would create the new feature for me. Very simple, very easy to use. Now remember I said to you the V key is pretty useful. So if you hold down your V key, you can see all the vertexes that you created. And if you wanted to change or modify anything, you would switch your task to do this. Again, this is not really in the context of this presentation. So let's switch to the building and see how we generate a building footprint. So this time around, I'm going to change to the building and I'm going to change my bookmark to my building footprint. So how do I go about creating a building? Well, this time around, the building is going to have some specific constraints applied to it. So my task is still create new feature. 
and I'm going to start with my very first vertex at this point right over here. Now, I want to constrain the direction and length of the next segment. So a right mouse click gives me access to the context menu, and I can get to direction and length. So the direction and length constraint at this point, I'm going to set my direction at 180, and I'm going to set my length at 30. Now, 30 here represents 30 feet. My current map units are feet. Now, if I chose to, I could use abbreviations and specify my distance in any other unit that is accepted and that has an appropriate abbreviation. I'm going to show you this in a minute, but right now let's constrain this next segment to be generated at a direction of 180 with a length of 30 feet. So notice how the new segment has been created. My next segment, I'd like to do the same thing. So this time I'm going to use Control G to get to the direction length option, which is again a constraint. And now my direction is 270, but my length is going to be, in this, time, this case, 14 meters. So notice how I've typed in the M abbreviation for meters at this point. Even though my map units are feet, the software knows how to convert from feet to meters at this stage for me. And that's one of the really nice tricks is being able to, at any point where you're typing in things like length, to apply abbreviations. Choosing the enter button, my new segment has been generated at 14 meter length from the previous one in the correct direction. So let's create one more. Let's create a tangent curve. So right mouse click, use tangent curve. Now my tangent curve at this point is going to have an arc length of 10. So I'm going to choose arc length of 10. And I'm going to specify the radius for this arc to be 50. So I type in 50 at this stage, and I would like this new curve to be generated to the left. Choose the Enter button. Notice how my new curve has been generated. Now, I could generate a second curve if I choose to, but since I'm really illustrating to you how to get to the constraints and how you can use and apply them, I'm really just going to finish the sketch very quickly at this point. And now I could use F2 to finish the sketch, and it's completed. So notice how we're applying shortcuts and using some of those shortcut keys with constraints and different parameters to create a feature. All right, so that concludes the very first demonstration for us. I'm going to stop editing at this point. I'm not really going to save the changes. And before continuing, I'm just going to activate the second data frame, which will be in preparation for the next option. All right, so let's take a look at some review. So in this last section, we created a lake polygon or a natural resource feature consisting of straight line segments. We also constructed a building footprint, and I introduced you to the use of constraints or sketch constraints while creating the feature. So Wayne, are we ready for some questions here? Yes, we are, Colin. Okay, we've had a few questions already. First, um, some questions about creating donut polygons or, or islands inside the lake that, that Colin was digitizing. Miguel from Island View and Ron from Trenton ask a similar question. What's the best way to sketch a polygon with a void inside of it? So what Colin could have done as he was digitizing with the sketch tool, he clicked some vertices and then he right clicked and said finish the sketch. He was creating a polygon. What he could have done alternatively is actually to say finish the part. So what that does is it says that that that's one part of my geometry. Then he could go and click his island on the inside, and then when he finishes the sketch, it will create an island with a, uh, or a lake with an island or, or a donut polygon. There's a couple of other ways you could actually do that. You could have created that um, lake polygon and then digitized another island polygon over the top of that and then with that island selected go on to the editor menu and the clip option and actually chose to, to cookie cut the island out of the lake. Good question. The next question is from uh, Esther in, in Boise is where can I find a list of these shortcut keys that, Alan, uh, that Colin keeps referring to? If you go to the uh, desktop help and type shortcut, you'll see that uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different topics. One of them is for uh, the editing shortcut. So you can go there to the ArcGIS desktop help. 
You could also go to the ESRI support site and type shortcuts and search, and you'll find a, a list of topics for keyboard shortcuts for the editor. Um, do we have time for one more question? Sure. Colin? Let's refresh and have a look. Okay. Um, there was one other question about the uh, the entering different kinds of units. Um, Colin showed how you could enter a distance and then use an abbreviation to say that I really meant to say it's in meters or feet or miles or kilometers or whatever. In the editor, you use the 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 lengths and distances you enter are in the units of the coordinate system of your map. If you want to use different units, you can always type that abbreviation. Now with directions and angles, Colin showed how you could type 180 degrees. Now if you had degrees, minutes, seconds, and you wanted to enter those values, then you could also do that anywhere in the editor. So if you go to the editing options, the units tab, there you have the ability to change the direction type, the direction units um, that that you enter into the uh, into the into the system. If you go to the ArcGIS desktop help and type direction, and there's a, a topic on measuring units, that'll help you to to work out how to set those different units. Colin, all right, Wayne. I think we're ready to return back to uh, our next topic, which are a few additional constraint challenges. So here we've taken some common questions that we get and we've uh, lifted them out as constraint challenges to teach you some new functionality. So here's a scenario. I need to autocomplete a parcel polygon using some street casings as the basis for part of the parcel boundary. Now a street casing is the equivalent of a road right of way and you'll notice in the graphic below that the top end of the cul-de-sac forms the street casing or road right of way and we're missing a polygon. So we need to create a new polygon, a new parcel polygon, that is coincident with that street casing, but also has its boundaries coincident with the surrounding polygons. And the challenge is, how do I go about doing this? Well, we start with an autocomplete polygon task, because we're creating a new polygon that we need to autocomplete. So we start using the sketch, con sketch tool with the autocomplete polygon task available, because we need to ensure that our snapping tolerances and snapping agents are also set up properly. And then what we do is we right mouse click on the road casing. Once, road, once we've right mouse clicked, we can use a constraint function called replace sketch. A replace sketch will literally copy the vertexes of the road casing into the current sketch that we are making. I think I've heard the term suck in the coordinates into the current sketch. And once you're done with that, your final step is, is to right mouse click anywhere within the polygon and use finish sketch. What then happens is it also copies in the vertexes and segment information from the surrounding polygons and completes the creation of this new polygon for us. This is a really, really nice function and very easy to use. So we use replace sketch and then finish sketch options. And I'm going to show you this in the next demo that we do after this. Another sketch constraint we have is creating a cul-de-sac. Now remember, most of the time, cul-de-sacs will be generated using coordinate geometry. So you'd use Kogo to generate a cul-de-sac, but you may from time to time need to generate a cul-de-sac interactively. Now keep in mind that the cul-de-sac may consist of several straight and curved line segments, and you may need to do some of these using the constraints for parallel or perpendicular or even tangent curve, or perhaps even using one of the sketch tools to create arts. So let's take a look at this. So to create the straight line segments, we create our very first vertex using the sketch tool. And we can apply one of those sketch constraints such as direction and length or parallel and complete the creation of that segment. To create the curved segment, which is the little curve that leads into the cul-de-sac, we could use the tangent curve tool or we could use the tangent curve constraint. In the graphic you're seeing here, we're using the tangent curve constraint on the sketch tool. We may use this if we have a specific arc length and radius for that small part of the curve leading into the cul-de-sac, or alternatively, we can use the tangent curve sketch tool to do the same thing. Next, we want to create the circular part of the cul-de-sac, and this is done using a sketch tool. 
either the endpoint arc tool or the arc sketch tool. If with the endpoint arc tool, we can place vertexes at both ends of the arc and adjust the radius of the arc that we're creating. And then finally, we generate the last small tangent curve and segments, and then complete the creation of the cul-de-sac. So let's see if we can do this in a small demo. But before we do, just to recap, for creating the curved segments, we start with our straight segments first, then use the sketch tool with sketch constraints such as tangent curve, or use the arc tool, endpoint arc tool, or tangent tool from the sketch tool palette to do the same thing. So let's take a quick short demonstration and show you how this is done. So in my first part of the demonstration, I have a parcel boundary, a parcel polygon that needs to be generated. It hasn't been created yet, but what I need to do is I need to use the coordinates of this road casing or road right of way as a basis for part of the boundary of the new polygon that I'm going to create in here. So I'm going to start editing. And my target layer is going to be the parcel layer at this point in time. And I need to ensure that my snapping tolerances are set correctly. And I'm going to set some snapping agents as well. Now I want to snap to the vertexes and edges of parcel. And I want the road casing vertexes and edges to snap as well. This is creating four different snap agents. And I want parcel snapping to take precedence and road casing thereafter. So by dragging these up and down, I'm setting what snap tolerance, uh, what snap agents take higher precedence over others. All right, next thing to do is I need to set my snap distance. So from the edit options menu, I'm going to set under the general tab my snap distance to be, say, 20 pixels. I'm not going to use anything else right now, except hit the OK button, and I'm ready to get started. So remember, what I'm going to use here is a replace sketch option or constraint. So I start with my sketch tool. Notice how the snapping has come in. And I'm going to take this boundary, and I'm going to copy its coordinates or suck them into the current sketch I'm making. So it should... All right, let's turn that snapping back, the snapping off at this point for a minute. And let's try that again. Ah, wrong one. Right, replace sketch should drag those coordinates in. We're having a momentary problem here. <laughs> right, it's not the create new feature task that we're using, by the way. We need to use the autocomplete task, which is why we're having this small technical problem. So replace sketch. Pulled in the coordinates. There we are. And next we want to do is we want to automatically clone these coordinates from the surrounding polygons. And this can be done easily and very quickly by using the finish sketch task. Notice how easy that was. I'm going to undo it and just redo it again quickly to show you. So I'm creating the parcel with the autocomplete task. I'm using my sketch tool. I right mouse click over the portion of the road casing that I would like to drag or copy the coordinates from and use replace sketch. And then finally, I want to finish the sketch. And in this way, my new polygon will have been created for me. That was really easy, wasn't it? Of course, remember to use the autocomplete polygon task and not the create new feature task as I had done earlier. Let's take a look at our second option, and this is to create a cul-de-sac. So the cul-de-sac creation is going to happen with a cut polygon task. So we need to make sure that our current task is cut polygon feature task. What I also need to ensure is, is that my parcel layer is the current selectable layer, which it is, in fact, by going to the selection tab. Now, I need to choose the target polygon that I'm going to cut, which is this one here, and I'm going to cut out a cul-de-sac from it. So to construct the cul-de-sac, I start with some straight line segments. So I'm going to start with my first segment to be. I'm going to change that snapping tolerance a little. In fact, what I'm going to do is just turn the snap agents off at this point. And I'm going to start with my first segment right here. And I want to constrain that first segment of the cul-de-sac to be parallel to this boundary. So I'm going to make it parallel. So notice how I've now got a constraint to be parallel. The next portion is I need to construct the tangent, the tangent curve which leads into the cul-de-sac. So I'm going to be using this tool here to construct it. Let's just undo that again. And notice that the tangent tool should allow me to uh, construct that slight curve. 
let's try that again. Okay, so undo that for a minute and go back to the tangent tool. We'll start again. <laughs> All right, up we go. Constrain with this parallel, parallel to that boundary right over there. Click, choose the tangent tool. All right, the tangent tool is not functioning very well at this point. We'll use the endpoint arc tool to create the next portion of the cul-de-sac. Wayne, do you want to take over here for a minute, please? <laughs> Wayne's real good at this, so he's going to create this one for us. <laughs> All right, that's our tangent tool, which is not working too well. There we go. And final part of the sketch is done that way. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you, Wayne. <laughs> that helped out. Uh, for some reason, our tangent tool wasn't working too well at this point. Um, I think we have a small technical hitch with that one. All right, um, let's stop editing at this point, and we're going to take some questions. Uh, again, let's not save any changes, and let's take a couple of questions, Wayne. OK. <clears throat> Thanks, Colin. So some of you had some questions about replace the, the replace sketch command. Uh, Jeffrey from Lexington asked, how is the replace sketch different from the trace tool? The, the function of replace sketch is to take the geometry of the features that, that you right click on and load them into the, the current edit sketch. So you can use the, the sketch needs to be the uh, sketch tool, but Basically, you're using the geometry of, a, of an existing feature. There was a related question, which was, do I have to use the, um, the replace sketch with the, the, the autocomplete um, task? And the, the answer is no. You can, you can use replace sketch with any, uh, of any task. I mean, the whole point of it is to actually take the, the geometry of the feature and load it into the edit sketch. And you can use it to create new features, to, to um, trace or to reshape an existing feature and so on. Okay, we had a, another question from Rick in Tempe who, who said uh, that he actually tried that autocomplete, autocomplete with replace, but he got an error that said that, um, that the autocomplete task could not be completed. So there, one of the things that could have happened there, Rick, is that when you, when you use the autocomplete task, you actually need to create a sketch that crosses from one side of the polygons that Colin was showing to the other side. Basically, you need to create a closed um, shape for the, for the other polygons. So, so that could have been the, the problem that you faced then. Um, here's an interesting question. In example two, this is Michael from Columbia. In example two, um, does the road casing have to be a GIS feature or could it be a feature stored in a drawing file, a DWG or a DXF or a, or a design file that you've loaded as a background layer? And the answer is that yes, you can actually use geometry like non-editable geometry um, from other workspaces or from CAD files when you're using the, the replace sketch command. The, the important thing there is when you add the CAD file, you, you need to add it as, as a CAD data set and not just as a, as a CAD file. Um, and final question, Eric from San Ramon. Are the arcs based off multiple line segments or are you creating or, or true curved lines? In Colin's example, his his road um, right away was actually a densified line, but in, in ArcGIS, in a geodatabase, you can create true circular arcs. So in the cul-de-sac example that Colin showed, the circular arcs were true um, true geometries with just two vertices at, at the other end and, and, a, and a circular arc. Colin. All right, I think we're ready to go to our next topic. So we have a couple of additional constraint challenges. Um, here's one on constructing street center lines. So I've been supplied some street casements um, 
maybe you call them road right of ways. And I need to generate the street center line where the vertices of the center line are relative to these street casements that I've been given, or relative to parcel boundaries um, that surround the road casements. So what sort of options do I have to generate these street center lines? Well, I could use the midpoint tool, which is one of the sketch tools that allows me to generate a new vertex at the midpoint of points that I have clicked. Or I could use the trace tool with an offset option. Or I could have used a parallel constraint while creating the new feature with the sketch tool. So those are three different options you may want to use when creating centerline. Probably your best result will come from using the midpoint tool. So we're going to begin centerline construction with the sketch tool first, which allows me to create the initial vertex at the point where I would like it to be. Then switch to the midpoint tool to continue creating the new center line. And with the midpoint tool, I basically click points across and the new vertex is placed at the midpoint of those points that I clicked while using the tool. Now, you might say, well, I know about this stuff already, but what's so special about it? Well, first of all, in order to ensure that the points that you're clicking to generate the midpoint from is correct, you should set a snapping tolerance and perhaps set up a snap agent. But you're going to find that when using a snapping tolerance and a snap agent, that this may significantly decrease a little performance while using the midpoint tool. But you can use a map cache to improve this performance quite significantly. And what happens with map cache is, is that the features in your current extent are pulled into a local cache on your machine. So in case your data is on a server, it'll make a local version of those features within your current extent and this will significantly improve performance with both the midpoint tool and, in fact, probably virtually anything that you may be doing in an edit session in ArcMap if you're using data across a network. So map caches are very useful, and this is the tip part of the specific um, constraint that, or challenge that we're looking at. Now, here's another constraint challenge. I'm working with a parking area polygon that has been surveyed, and um, because of an increase in the number of offices, I have to increase the size of the number of parking spaces, or I need to take this parking area polygon and increase its size using the same angles. And uh, I don't really want to go out and resurvey because I know that if I offset the parking area by 25 feet, I can increase the polygon significantly. So how do I go about doing that? Well, one way is to use the trace tool. Now remember the trace tool requires you to pre-select the feature and then you trace the code or trace the boundary of that selected feature. But what the trace tool also offers us with an O key when you press down on it before using it is the option to get to some trace options. And one of those is to set an offset distance. Another, of course, is to set how the corners should be handled. And because we're making a direct copy, if we like, but offset by a certain amount, we're going to use the mitre or squared corner option. So here's how we go about using the trace tool to create this new polygon that is offset by 25 feet from the existing. So we select our source polygon, we use the trace tool and then click the O key and type in our offset value. Now remember with the offset value, zero means no offset, positive means trace to the right, negative means trace to the left, and tab means switch sides while I'm tracing. So I'm going to type in a trace value of 25 and nothing else, and of course ensure that my corners are mitered. Then I start the trace itself by moving my cursor. And of course the trace tool will now trace new vertexes and create new segments offset it by 25 feet from the source polygons. And finally I finish my trace offset, hit F2, and a new polygon will have been created for me. Now in this example, the polygon was created inside of the same source feature class as the source feature that I was using as a basis. But I could have taken the trace result and placed it in another feature class if I wanted to. So some of you might say, well, trace sounds like a bit of a long way around. Why can't I just use the buffer tool to do the same thing? Well, sure you could. You could use a buffer function to create a new feature at a buffer distance. The problem with buffer here is, is that you don't have any control over how the corners are handled. They'll always be curved or rounded corners. Whereas with the trace tool and the offset and the option for a mitered corner, you'll get a perfect or almost perfect clone, if you like, but offset by a certain value from the source feature. So let's go and show you these in a small demonstration. So right now, 
I'm going to switch my data frame around and I need to just ensure that I'm not in editing mode. And I'm going to use another shortcut key to focus on another data frame called the Alt. So hold the Alt key down and click on this and I'm actually going to switch data frames this way. So first thing I'm going to show you is how to create the center lines. So let's start editing. And we're going to be working with our road layer at this point in time. And I'm going to be creating a new feature. So I, what I need to do is I need to ensure that my snap agents are set up and I need to ensure that my snap distance is set up. So I'm going to make the snap distance a little big at this point. In fact, I'm going to leave it at 20, but I'm going to turn snap tips on so you can see which snap agents will be invoked. Next, I'm going to set some snap agents. Now, two layers involved here. I'm going to be using the parking, the parcel layer and the roads layer. But what I want is, I want to be able to snap to the vertexes of the parcels, and I want my roads that I'm creating, my new road feature that I'm creating with the midpoint tool to snap to those vertexes. So I'm going to turn on four different snap agents at this point, and I'm ready to get started. Now you may remember that I usually create my first initial vertex with the sketch tool. So I start with the sketch tool, and as I move my cursor around, Notice how the snapping is invoked. And I'd like to snap to this point here to start my first vertex. Next, I'm going to switch to the midpoint tool. Now, midpoint tool will require me to do this, to click across. And if I hold down my V key, I can actually see the vertexes that I'll be snapping to. Now, because there's so many of them here, the process is pretty erratic. So before continuing, I'm just going to stop what I'm doing and I'm going to go and use the map cache and build a map cache to illustrate how it can improve performance. So I've already brought up the map cache menu, and the first button here allows me to build a map cache. So I'm going to build a map cache. Now, if I click this button, you can see the extent of the map cache. And it flashes very briefly to show you the current extent of the map, map cache. So map cache is now built. If I start the process of creating the new feature again with the sketch tool this time, I need to ensure that my first vertex is set right over here. Then I'm going to switch to my midpoint tool. You'll notice that the performance is significantly better. It's not as jumpy as it was earlier. So let's do midpoint tool. and Let's go ahead and create our feature. And we can be assured that our feature is being generated fairly clearly and fairly correctly at the midpoint of the points that we are clicking. When we're finished, what do we do to finish? F2 will finish up for us at this stage, and our new center line has been constructed. The important thing here is the use of the map cache to improve performance. All right, so let's switch over and let's have a look at using the trace tool to increase the size of our parking lot. So let's change our bookmark to parking lots. I'm going to dismiss the map cache at this point and remove that from our menu. I need to change my target layer to parking lot. And of course, I also need to ensure that my parking lot layer is the current selectable layer. So what I need to do next is I want to create a new feature that is offset by 25 feet from this existing parking lot polygon. So I'm going to use the edit tool to select the polygon, and I'm going to use the trace tool. Now, if I use the trace tool, it would create a new feature perfectly coincident to this one right over here. But I don't want to do that. So my trace tool is currently active, so I hit the O key to get to the options. Move across, and I'm going to type in a 25 feet offset value. Also notice that my current corner handling is mitered. I'm not going to use any of the other options. So now my trace tool should trace 25 feet offset from the selected features vertexes and segments for me. Notice how it's created those, and then of course F2 to finish sketch, and my new polygon will have been created. Now I happen to have created this new polygon in the same layer as the source layer, so I actually have two polygons coincident. I could have had a different target layer if I wanted to at this point. All right, now that concludes the second demonstration, and let's stop editing at this stage, and not save edits at this point, and let's just activate our final data frame for what we'll be looking at a little bit later. All right, so Wayne, let's take a couple of questions after the review.
So in this last section, we looked at creating new segments from existing features using the midpoint tool. We earlier looked at creating a cul-de-sac, creating street center lines, using feature offset with the trace tool, and we also contrasted the buffer and the trace tool with each other. So Wayne, do we have some questions? Yes, we do, Colin. <coughs> we have a few questions about the map cache. Holly from Virginia Beach asked, what is the map cache actually doing for performance? So what happens here is that the, the features, the geodatabase features in the current extent are placed into memory. So, so, um, so any editing operations happen both on the, the geometries in, or the features in memory, as well as the ones in the database. What the effect is for you is that, is that when you are doing snapping, as Colin was, was doing, um, you can see a better performance because we can go into the computer's memory and find those features much faster than we, than we can if we have to go out to the, to the disk. A related question on map cache is, if I, from Matt in Medina, if I zoom in or out, should I resave the map cache every time I change scale? So the map cache, the way it works is it works for a rectangle, the, the visible extent when you build it. So there are a couple of strategies you can use to, um, to mean that you don't have to rebuild it the way that um, Matt suggested. What you want to do is before you start your editing in an area, zoom out to an extent two or three times larger than the, than the, um, the area you want to work in. Build the map cache. So then, as you zoom and pan around that work area, the map cache will be there. It'll be updated as you edit features, change attributes, split, create new features, and so on, so that you'll always be using the map cache. The final question came from Stephen in Lexington. Does the map cache get cleared out when you exit ArcMap, or do you need to routinely delete it? So the map cache is entirely in memory. So um, as soon as you close ArcMap, it will go away and there's nothing you need to do to, to, uh, to clean up. Okay. All right. Actually, um, I'm, I'm going to take one here too. We had a question from Jeffrey in Hayward asking, is there a way to temporarily suspend the snapping? And the answer is yes, Jeffrey. You just hold your space bar down and that will temporarily suspend your snapping when you're doing it. Um, another question I think uh, which was quite a relevant one was how did I get to see the vertices while I was busy working? Well, just hold your V key down as you're sketching and that'll show you vertices and um, the vertices that you are working with. And that's uh, pretty useful to do um, while I was working with the midpoint tool. Okay, so let's continue with our final topic which is called subdividing lines and we have a couple of uh, challenges here. So a challenge I've been asked quite a few times when working with geometric networks is, is I need to take an existing line feature, a water utility line that is, and it needs to be subdivided into several segments. And I want to generate these new segments, but also endpoints to be created at each of the segments. So it's a twofold process. Take an existing line, break it up into pieces, but also create coincident points at those pieces that I have broken up. So how would I go about doing this? Well, to break up a line, use the divide command. So from the edit menu, the divide command will allow you to divide up a selected line feature in the target layer. You can specify either an evenly spaced number of segments to create or to place points separated by every number of units or place points separated by every X number of measure units if you wanted to. In my case, I'm going to use the standard divide with a evenly placed number of division points or segments to be created. So my original line was 20 meters long. I chose three segments. The software automatically created three equally sized segments for me of the line. Now, the important thing to remember here is the source line feature remains, but three new features were created. So in my example, which we'll show you in the demo, I've chosen my target line feature class and my target line feature that I would like to divide. Then from the edit menu, I've chosen the divide command, and that shows the place four points along line spaced evenly option. What then happens is four new line features were generated. The original line remained, and the original and subdivided lines remained selected for me after I did this. 
Now keep in mind, my next step would be to create the point features. So I unselect the four divided segments that were generated, keep the remaining original line selected, and then change my target layer to the point feature class. Now, when I use the divide command, it'll create points along the line that I had earlier selected. Now, the trick here is that you place one fewer point along the line than you had segments of lines you created. Because when generating points, the software automatically generates two points at the end point of the line. So the end result is, is that five new points will have been created. Three at the subdivision points and one at each end of the line. And as a final step, you could go back to the line feature class, select that original line that you had, and delete it. So that's a subdivision function. Just to recap, to subdivide, subdivide lines, choose the target line feature class, select the target line feature, use the divide command, and specify the number of points along the line to create. To create the points, change your target layer to point, unselect the divided features, select the original line, Use the divide command, but one fewer point to create than the number of line segments. And then five points will have been created in this example, one at each end point. Now here's another interesting challenge. <clears throat> this one is proportioning by percentage. So the scenario is I have a line that needs to be subdivided by different percentages. But I don't really want to go and calculate the percentages myself. So my original line length was 342.2. I wanted to subdivide it into a 25, 50, and 25% of the original 342.2. How could I do this in a fairly easy way? Well, the easy way to do it is to use the proportion tool available from the advanced editing tools on the advanced editor toolbox. Now, the proportion tool is a pretty useful tool for taking the existing line feature and breaking it up into segments. The trick here is, is for you to decide on some base value to define the percentage to divide up by. So because my line was 342, I arbitrarily chose to divide up a thousand into percentages or into portions. So I said my first portion is 250 long or 25% of the total of 342.2. My second percentage is 50% or 500 of that arbitrary base value that I chose, and therefore it was divided up. And my final value was 250 or 25% of my total base that I chose to be 1,000. Now, I could have used 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and 0 0.25, or I could have used 25, 50, or 25, because my line was greater than 342, was close to 1,000, I decided to use 1,000 as my base value. You could have chosen any 1, 100, 10, 1,000, any of those to figure out what the base percentage value should be. So since I entered 1,000 as my base percentage and my line length was 342.2, the original line was now proportioned into 85.6, which represented 25%. 1.7, 171.1, which represented 50%, and 85.6, which represented another 25% of the original total length. So to recap, the proportion works in this way. Either select the target and use the proportion tool and enter your own individual segment lengths of the total to proportion. Or select the target layer, use the proportion tool, and enter base percentages, not actual segment lengths. Choose those base percentages to be either a base of something like 1, 10, 100, 1,000, or whatever. I chose 1,000 because my line was 342.1 or whatever it was. Okay, so let's go and show you how this works in a small demo. So we need to change our data frame, and we need to ensure that we're at the right bookmark. So at this point, we're at the subdivision bookmark, and I'm going to subdivide my water main line into four equal segments. So I'm going to start editing at this point and make sure that my current water line layer is the target layer. I'm also going to ensure that water, mine, water main line is my current selectable layer. Now using the edit tool, I'm going to select the target line feature. Then I'm going to use the divide command. 
So notice it's one of the editor functions, divide. Let's move this out over here and let's place four line segments to be created. Choose the OK button and in this process four line segments were created. How do I know? Because currently four line segments are the current selected line segments. Now a little trick here, with the line segments if you want to toggle between line segments you could use the N key while selecting and the N key will show you how it will cycle between different selected features. So I'm just going to select one feature right now and that is the entire line. Now why am I doing that? Well remember both I'm both segmenting the original source but I'm also going to create new point features. So to create the new point features I'm toggling to my point layer and again the one line the original source line is selected I'm going to use the divide command. This time, divide is going to create points in my target layer, which is called valves. Remember, I created four segments earlier. I'm now going to create three points. And by default, a new point will be placed at the end point of the source line as well, each end point in this case. Choose the OK button, and the software goes ahead and generates four new or five new points for me in the target layer that I've been working with. Right, so that shows you a little bit more about using the divide command to create both line segments and point features. Of course, my final step would be to delete the original line, which I no longer need. Let's go and have a look at the proportion command, and let's see how we use the proportion command with those base percentages. So my target layer, again, is water main line, and I'm going to select the target line feature that I'm going to proportion. Now, where do I find the proportion tool? From the editor menu, under more editing tools under advanced editing. Now the advanced editing toolbar has several tools for me but what I'm going to be using is this proportion tool right over here. So the proportion tool allows me to enter either specific lengths to proportion by or in my case I'm going to use these base values. So notice the total length is 342.2. I'm going to specify that my first length to proportion is 25 or 250, doesn't really matter, whichever base I decide to use. I'm using a base of 1,000, so I'll use 250. Next, I want 50% or 500 of 1,000. And lastly, I want 250 or 25% of the remainder. So my entered length or base value was 1,000. My total length was this much. And so, I, therefore, it proportioned the original length into 25, 50, and 25% amounts. So you could have used any base value, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, any one you chose to. I arbitrarily chose to use 1,000 at this point. Now, notice as I click the OK button, it goes ahead and proportions. My very first segment makes up 25%, 50%, and 25% of the total. And how do I know the lengths? Well, let's just label the feature, and I see that my lengths have now been generated for me. Okay, so that illustrates very briefly how to use the divide and proportion tool. So we looked at subdividing a line and creating points at the same time, and we looked at proportioning by percentage. Wayne, do we have some time? We have some time here for some questions, right? Yes. Yes, Colin? Okay. Um, first question, interesting one. Dean from Overland Park. Does the subdivide line create point command, create a unique ID, point ID, and a from to point ID in the line feature? The answer is no, it doesn't, Dean. What, what you're doing is you're creating unique features and um, different from, uh, from workstation like Info, <coughs> where there was a, a requirement to have a from to node, in a geodatabase feature class, you'll just get two unique features and they'll be connected. Their geometry will be coincident, but there's no need to have an attribute which uh, describes their their relationship. Another question, Robbie from Fort Collins. Please explain the difference between the three divide choices and in particular the difference between units and measured units. That's an interesting question as well, Robbie. So on the divide command, there are three options. Place so many points along the line spaced evenly. You'd use this option to, to split the line into equal parts. Um, and 
that's basically what that does. Now the next option, the place points separate, separated by every units, what you're going to do here is actually going to enter uh, map units to say I want this feature to be split into uh, segments that are 50 feet long or, or 25 feet long. Now as before you can enter uh, the abbreviation units here so you could put 1m, 1 meter so you get a lot of small features that are all 1 meter long. The third option here is to place points every every um, so many measure units. Now what's a measure unit? If you would created your line feature class as an M aware feature class, that's used for routing and um, primarily dynamic linear seg reference. Dynamic segmentation. Dynamic well. segmentation. Um, so if you had an M aware line feature, then you could actually split up the, uh, the, the line, or if the target was a point feature class, you'd be able to add points at every measure along that line. Now, one thing you could do, and this is something that Colin brought up before, but if you see on the, the title bar, there's a question mark, you can always click on the question mark and click on one of the controls, and it'll show you help about what the, uh, the individual parts of the dialogue are, are, are for. Okay. Another question. Ashish from Dubai. Do we have shortcut key to toggle between the sketch and the trace tool? This is an interesting question because there is a, a shortcut key to, to toggle between the sketch tool and the edit tool and the edit annotation tool, and it's basically pressing the E key, the E for elephant, that's my accent, E. So if you press that key, it'll toggle between those three tools, but it won't switch between the trace tool or the arc tool or any of those other tools. We, we added that capability because we felt that those three commands, the edit tool, the edit annotation tool, and the sketch tool were something that you that you want to toggle between quite commonly. Okay, there was a couple of uh, sketch uh, snapping questions. First one was, where was that, Colin? I'm trying to find it. Uh, um, Sandy from Orem. When would you use the snap agent to end versus vertex? So when Colin opened the, uh, the snapping window, you saw that there were three options vertex, end, and edge, or in, in fact it's vertex, edge, and end. That's the order that the, um, that the, or at least they're the different kinds of parts of the feature geometry that we can snap to. End is the end vertices of a line feature, or if it was a polygon, it would be the, the, the one start and, and end vertex, the one which the polygon loops back to. So if you wanted to snap to the ends of existing lines, you would use you would just check the end option. If you wanted to snap to any vertex along a line or a polygon, you would use the vertex option. Another question was from Denise in Boston. How does moving the layer names up and down in the snapping environment affect the way snapping works? So what happens here Denise is that is that the snapping environment by default works in the display order, the, the order that the layers are in the map. So typically you would have the points, your point layers on top, and then your line layers and then your polygon layers. And so if you turn on snapping for multiple layers, that's what you'd see. If you were close to a point and a line and you'd turned on snapping for both then because that point layer was on top, you would snap to that first. Now what we've done is we've provided a way for you to override that. So what Colin's done is he's dragged the parcels layer, the parcel polygons layer to the top. So even though a point feature may be above the polygon, we'll snap to the, to the um, parcel polygon first. Um, I think we're uh, running out of time here quite rapidly actually. Um, so, 
Everyone, just uh, in a few weeks' time, the recording for the seminar will be available for free on the ESRI virtual campus, and the re-resources listed on the slide uh, and more will be accessible for the recorded seminar. Just briefly, I'd like to point out that there are several virtual campus courses. There is a virtual campus course entitled Editing in ArcGIS 9 Tips and Tricks, and one entitled Creating and Editing Geodatabase Features in ArcGIS 9. We also have a brand new instructor-led class called Data Production and Editing Techniques that covers a lot of this information and a lot more. Some other resources you may want to look at is the ArcMap Editing and Tips and Tricks article and PDF you can download from the Arc User magazine. There's also a um, Arc User article called Be More Productive with Map Cache uh, that you can also download from the Arc User magazine online at esri.com. And you should also have a look at your individual editing in ArcMap documentation that comes on your documentation CD. We hope you enjoyed today's seminar, and on behalf of the SRI, I'd like to thank you for attending.